doing in 1 Corinthians. We didn't quite make it through 1 Corinthians chapter 10 last week. Um, so we're going to be picking it up today where we left off, which would be verse 14. Um, also, open up to there, put a, your bulletin in there to mark the place or something in your finger, and turn with me also to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. Um, incidentally, if you go to the website which has been newly redesigned, there is a whole missions page there where you can look and you can see the missions that we support um, and some information about them. So in Numbers chapter 25, we have the continuation of the story of Balak and Balaam. Um, you guys have probably heard those names, I would imagine, if you've been Coming here for any length of time, you certainly have. Balak was the Moabite king. And as Israel was passing through on their way to the promised land, they were passing through his land, and they had asked for permission. But uh, they did not, uh, Balak did not want to give them permission. And so Balak actually hired, he went and hired Balaam, to curse Israel. But try as he might, Balaam was unable to curse Israel. Whenever he opened his mouth, all that came out was a blessing towards Israel. Now how about that for a work of God, right? What, what, what comes out of your mouth more often? Cursing or blessing? It's a good thing to think about. Curses or blessing? What comes out of our mouth? Is it glorifying to the Lord? Anyway, the Lord was supernaturally acting in favor of Israel. They didn't even know that he was working on their behalf, kind of in the background, but he was. You know, God also works in the background of our lives, too. That's kind of how that whole uh, all things work together for good to those who love God, how that works. You know, we don't understand it. We don't uh, perceive it a lot of times, but God is working in the background on our behalf. Now, Balaam quit, but before he left Balak, he advised Balak to send Moabite women into the camp of Israel to invite them to their uh, uh, idol feast. We read there in Numbers 25, starting with verse 1, it says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. So Israel took the bait, so to speak. They received the Moabite women into the camp. Before long, they were uh, eating at the feast to the Moabite gods. The point is, what we need to consider here is that one thing leads to another. One thing leads to another. Sexual immorality and not remaining separate in the case of Israel led to idolatry. And like Adam and Eve, it's very easy for us to, to reason our way into sin. In Genesis 3, it says that Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. I find it interesting that in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul deals with high thinking or prideful knowledge first. Find that in chapters 1 through 4. Then he moves on to sexual immorality in chapters 5 through 7. And from there he moves on to dealing with idolatry in chapters 8 through 10. We can see a progression there and even in the way that he deals with it. Now, both Jesus and Paul likened sin to leaven. The leaven is the stuff that causes dough to rise. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Exposure to leaven can leaven the lump just as a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So exposure to sin in our lives, if we place ourselves maybe standing next to temptation or in a situation where we are uh, engaging in sin, it doesn't just stay there. It reaches into all the other areas of our lives. A little leads to a lot. A small amount is all it takes. 
It's interesting that adding salt can limit the effects of leaven. Jesus said that believers were the salt of the earth. So then if, if salt is removed, such as I, I believe that the church will be removed in a pre-tribulation rapture, the leaven or sin can go unchecked. I believe that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where we see mention of the restrainer, I believe that restrainer that Paul talks about there is the Holy Spirit indwelt church. Now for the Christian, going to church has a salting effect even in our own lives, limiting the effect of the leaven of the world in our lives. But here's what I want us to consider this morning. We are to have a salting effect on others. We are to have a salting effect on others. Last week, I, I thought we would make it through that entire chapter, all of chapter 10, you know, but God had other plans. So you know, today we're picking it up here with verse 14 of chapter 10. The, the first word that we're going to see there is therefore. And so we are able to say, the thing that every pastor has ever said to their congregation, when you see the word, therefore, we ask ourselves, well, what is it there for? And so let's take a moment to think about what Paul was expressing prior to this paragraph so that we uh, have everything in context and, and can understand exactly what he's talking about. Paul had been speaking to the Corinthian Christians regarding things that we might say, fall into a gray area of Christian discernment. There are things that a Christian may participate in and which are not condemned uh, in absolute terms in Scripture. I've, I've used alcohol as an illustration several times now. So you know, let's, think, let's see if we can think of anything else. There, there might be something else that perhaps is relevant to today. How about something like participation in a homosexual wedding. A homosexual wedding is not an issue the Bible explicitly addresses. Nowhere in the Bible is there a direct you shall or you shall not regarding attending a gay wedding. But the Bible does say that homosexual acts are an abomination to God. And the Bible does say that God's children are to be holy and consecrated to him. A consecrated means divided from those things that just aren't in line with God's character. At the same time, Jesus is God, and he ate at the table of sinners. So we might have some questions here. And actually, if you think about that in a larger sense, Jesus humbled himself to come live among sinners. We're all sinners. But Jesus upheld Scripture. It's God's written word. Never did Jesus condone sin, nor did he participate in the behaviors of the ungodly. Some Christian leaders say that a Christian should have no misgivings about attending the wedding of a man to a man or a woman to a woman. They would argue it this way. One's presence at a gay wedding does not necessarily indicate support for the homosexual lifestyle. They would point out that the presence of a believer at the wedding would be an act of love and friendship, which would extend the love of Christ towards them. We probably would not hesitate to go to the wedding of a friend who, like all of us, is an unbeliever. If the other sins of a friend would not prevent us from attending their wedding, why would the sin of homosexuality be different? Well, the problem, the problem is that a homosexual wedding is the celebration of a lifestyle that God says is an abomination to him. Participation, identification, and attendance are wrong because our attendance shows acceptance. Our attendance reinforces their unrepentant attitude towards, toward the sin that they are embracing. Our identification with a celebration of an unrepentant sinful lifestyle lends some credence or credibility to it. And we then become a stumbling block to the saved and the unsaved. 
re reinforce their sin rather than confront it. And considering the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, if we do love them, we cannot participate in that which celebrates rather than confronts their lifestyle. A Christian who participates in a gay wedding because a celebrant of, of that which God says is wrong, and for those reasons, Christians just should not do so. Now, Paul, in this chapter, he warned about being identified with ungodliness. He began by pointing out that the Israelites were identified as God's special people. But they also participated in idolatry, sexual immorality, and other evil things that they desired. And this was a conflict for them. When they participated in those things that were contrary to God's character, they caused confusion in the minds of those to whom they were to be ambassadors of God. In the latter half of chapter 10, Paul comes back to the argument that he was making all the way back in chapter 8 about food uh, offered to idols. Some Christians may have participated in the feasts to idols that happened at the many temples that were in Corinth. Others ate food from the markets without knowing whether the meat that they purchased uh, came from animal sacrifices that were made to idols. And still others thought that eating meat should be avoided completely since you know, they couldn't know what the source of the meat was. Another issue was those who ate at the temple bragged that they were more knowledgeable because they felt that they were at liberty to do that. After all, idols are nothing. There's just one God, Yahweh. So they thought they were the more knowledgeable Christians. They did not, they did not have reservations about participating in, a, in an idolatrous feast. The only thing was they really weren't knowledgeable, Paul says. If they were, they would not use their liberty in a way that could stumble others. So the basis for all that we have discussed in the last three chapters has been liberty. The, the reasoning went something like this. Because idols aren't anything and certainly aren't gods, isn't eating food sacrificed to them of no consequence? And isn't participating in the feast then okay too? Now perhaps it... it Perhaps it came as a shock to them that Paul said it is indeed of great consequence. What if a person's walk with Christ is hindered or even wrecked by witnessing them eating at the temple of an idol? Is that of no consequence? Well, absolutely not. Is it a small thing to possibly stumble someone whom Christ suffered and died for? Absolutely not that cannot be considered of, of small or no consequence. In fact, Jesus thinks not. In Matthew 18, 6, he said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And Paul makes a good example of himself here. Paul said in chapter 8 that he would rather never eat meat again than stumble someone in terms of the gospel. Because the gospel is much more important than his personal Christian liberty. 1 Corinthians 8.13, Paul said, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now, that's a commitment. To, to say that you would be willing to forego ribeyes you know, and brats, a good pork chop for a lifetime? Here, here in football land, tailgate land, that, that would have gone over like a ton of bricks. Pieces in Texas and half the congregation walks out. If the case is that we are not concerned for one another, that we're wrong not to be, at least we should be concerned for ourselves. Now, why be concerned for ourselves in regards to this? Well, for one, if we are able to harm another without offending our own conscience, there is a spiritual problem there. And also, for this, compromise leads to compromise. One thing leads to another, and eating at the feast of an idol soon becomes 
kneeling at that altar. So Paul goes from what should be our natural Christian concern for one another and a pattern of self-denial to the benefit of others in chapter 9 to talk about ways that we can be stumbled in our own walk in chapter 10. Now we saw these last week, idolatry, sexual immorality, testing the Lord, and grumbling or complaining. Paul shows us examples from the history of the children of Israel. And then wrapped up last week, Paul, Paul wrapped up last week with this exhortation, take heed lest ye fall, an encouragement that you are not alone in temptation. God will always also always provide the means of escape. These are good words for anyone who struggles with temptation. But of course, that's for, that's for the Wednesday night crowd, right? We don't, we're the Sunday morning crowd. We don't struggle with temptation. Now, in the second half of our chapter, Paul returns to the subject of eating idol sacrificed meat. And Paul's point basically boils down to this. Consider your viewership. Consider your viewership. You may have thought, well, I have a viewership. That sounds awfully silly to say I have a viewership. Nobody changed the channel on their TV and pulls me up. At least you hope not. Maybe somewhere they do. But we all do have a viewership. People who know that we are Christians and watch what we do. In a very, very real way, our lives are a testimony. What you do matters. What you say matters. If someone's salvation depends on it, be very careful about what you say and you do. Don't become legalistic because you know, that's, being legalistic is just a, as bad a testimony of Christ. You are indeed free in Christ, but don't use that as an opportunity for the flesh, as an opportunity to sin. Paul wrote in Galatians 5, you, my brothers and sisters... We're called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So then the goal of our study this morning is really the same as it was last week. And that is to recognize that Christians are not exempt from troubles, temptation. And this is really the part that we're going to be dealing with mostly today. Nor from responsibility. So let's dig in with verse 14 of chapter 10. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. Now prior to this, Paul had said, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So Paul tells us what that, that way of escape that God provides is. It's fleeing. Flee from idolatry. Paul says idolatry, that's what he's been dealing with here. But the same principle works for every kind of temptation that we have. Get away from it. Don't hang out right next to it. If you hang out right next to it, chances are you're going to be drawn into it. Don't hang out next to, next to temptation. But flee temptation. Run, don't walk. Run. And Paul's not at all ambiguous here in his wording. He's stern, but he's also a concerned brother. He's a concerned colleague, so to speak, with the Christians there in Corinth. And this is really great advice when we deal with difficult issues with one another even. Kindness goes a very long way when it comes to, to confronting in love. But also, ambiguity is not the way to go. Ambiguity will only reinforce our rationalization, our ability to rationalize hanging out next to temptation. Now, Paul's practical application. Flee. Flee from idolatry. How's that for a practical application? Get out of there. Split. In the end, all sin is idolatry because it is putting something before your relationship with God. So Paul says, hey, don't don't just walk from it. Don't take a stroll away from it. Run. Run from it. Flee. 
So pay attention. Look for escape and then run. In the presence of temptation, that's just not the place to take a stand. I, I know that's kind of what we feel like that's the valiant thing to do when we're in temptation. We've got to take our stand. But Paul says, don't take a stand. Flee. Do what Joseph did. God says that he will make the way of escape. Take it. You know, the wisest man in the world, Solomon, wasn't able to withstand temptation. God said the king was not to accumulate horses or wives for himself or to cause the people to do so. Solomon made decisions that were in direct violation of God's law, and there were consequences. Now, if the wisest man in the world can get suckered into sin, then surely all of us also stand a pretty good chance if we hang out next to temptation. Wisdom is applied knowledge. It helps us make decisions that honor the Lord and agree with the Scriptures. And not only did Solomon do those things, having lots of wives and, and building up his personal bank account and all that, but he was influenced by it all. He was influenced by his wives, his foreign wives, to, to worship idols. He even sacrificed his children to Molech. And that was, you know, if you're familiar with how those sacrifices worked, it's horrendous. You know, a giant bronze statue of, of this God with his arms out, heated up to being red hot, and then walking up and placing your baby, your child, in the arms of that, of that idol. They would play drums so that you wouldn't hear the screaming. The wisest man in the world gave in. He, he fell into this. God instructed Solomon. God gave him wisdom, but he also allowed Solomon to make his own choices. If the wisest man who has ever lived can yield to temptation, even temptation to do the most horrendous things we could possibly think of, then don't think that you are somehow immune, because you're not. One of the ways of escape that Paul says God will provide for temptation is just simply fleeing. Corinth was a hotbed of idolatry. The Christians there could have been in danger of falling back into their old ways. Going to feasts where the meat has been sacrificed to idols, that would present temptation. Someone may have said, well, the food is better there, or it's free, or we'll be witnesses to the people there. And having a relationship with the living God as they did was the danger really that they would fall back into idolatry. Well, these days we don't understand the temptation to, to, to seat ourselves before inanimate objects and give it all our attention, do we? Or do we? So idolatry isn't such a strange, strange concept. Even if the Corinthian Christians were strong enough to withstand the temptation, perhaps someone going with them or someone seeing them there would not be. So Paul says, use common sense. Don't hang around the edges of stuff that will pull you away from Christ. The, the Red Baron of, of Snoopy fame. Well, it was much more real when he was a fighter pilot shooting down other pilots in World War I. But we really aren't so much aware of how he ended up being shot down. You know, we've, we've all heard of the Red Baron, but we probably don't know the full story. Well, he was pursuing a Canadian airplane. Yeah, I said Canadian. He was pursuing a Canadian airplane. And that airplane crossed over enemy lines, and Red Baron followed 
and got shot down that way. The pilot that couldn't be shot down before was easily shot down when he crossed the line. So don't hang around the edges of temptation. It's a mistake to think that there is no power at all in associating with the things of your past that are contrary to the character of Christ. This is why it's dangerous for an ex-alcohol abusing Christian to minister to alcoholics. But also for other Christians to exercise their right to have a drink without considering their brother in Christ. That is also dangerous for everyone. Paul says, I speak as to wise men. Another way to put that is, are you wise or do you show yourself as a fool? Proverbs 12.15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Do we hear the wisdom of God's word here and then fight it with our will? You know, we might say that's for someone else, that's not for me. Or, or who, is, who is Pastor Sean? Who is he to challenge my having a drink? Well, I, I, I'm nobody. I, I've never aspired to really be, well, not, not in recent times have I aspired to really be anybody. I aspire to glorify God. But, but instead of asking that question, who am I to say, how about who are you to argue with what the Holy Spirit imp- inspired the Apostle Paul to write? If that's you, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be preached at, then you need to take that attitude to Jesus. Paul was speaking to the Christians in Corinth, but it's applicable in a very spiritual sense to everyone. And it's not exclusive of anyone. Let's keep going. Verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. See, in those days, sharing a meal was more than just sharing food. It was sharing fellowship. In some cases, such as in the the breaking of bread or the sharing of cups of of a cup of dipping sauce, it was sharing whatever you had on your hands. That's the kind of of meal that we're going to have this afternoon. Well, that sounded bad. We're going to be sanitary. (laughs) Of course, remember, our kids will be hitting the buffet first, right? Communion or uh, koinonia. Our oneness in Christ is what we celebrate together as we partake of the bread and the juice like we did this morning. In the time of Christ, sharing a meal was a very intimate expression of fellowship between people. Typically, they would recline at a table. They didn't have tables with chairs like we do today. They would recline at the table. And that would put you awfully close to the next person. Probably be very uncomfortable for us today to do that. But they would recline together at this low table and eat from one loaf of bread, dipping that bread in a, in a common dish that was filled like with this, this stew-like sauce. And, and they considered themselves then uniquely bonded together by the nutrients that they were sharing. Today, Together, we we also celebrated the unique bond that we share together through faith in Christ, the the koinonia, the the oneness of the body of Christ. Now, look back at what Paul said in, in the first paragraph of the chapter. For Israel, he brings up the Red Sea and these other things that took place when Israel was during their during Israel's wandering in the wilderness. For Israel, the crossing of the Red Sea, Paul said, was identification with God. Remember, we looked at that word, um, baptizo, that, that is transliterated in our scripture, but not translated in our scripture. The meaning is identified, identification. So for Israel, the crossing of the Red Sea, Paul says, was identification with God. He brought them out of Egypt. He made the way for them to cross through the Red Sea. 
they were his special people, and he took care of them. Now, Paul spoke of the manna and the water from the rock. Both of these things followed them. Jesus identified himself as the manna. In, in, in John 6, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, if it, or it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus was referring to himself there. And in verse 4 of our chapter, Paul also identified Jesus as the rock which they drank of. Jesus, in the, in the last day of that great feast, the last great feast day of Sukkot, stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, last week I had you circle some words and Put some other marks in your Bible there. You, you circled the word all in verses 1 and verse 2. And I don't remember if I told you last week, but if I didn't, in verse 4 there's, there's this phrase, followed them. You can underline that. Because this is going to emphasize for us that identification with God for Israel meant the water from the rock also and the manna. We know that the manna went with them. God provided it wherever they were. Paul says the rock went with them, providing life-giving water. And, and yes, these are pictures of Christ. But to the Israelites, a symbol of their identity as the special people of God who God cared for. Now hear me out, guys. I, I want you to make this connection. This is a very important connection for us to make here. Their identity went with them. Their identity went with them. They were the people of God whom God brought out of Egypt through the sea and cared for by manna and hard water. That's why I always thought it would come from a rock, right? Hard water. <laughs> but you know a three-letter word for hard water? Ice. <laughs> I know, that. that's cold. <laughs> Disregard any of that. To reinforce this point <laughs> about Israel's identity as the people of God, that that identity went with them, that that identity followed with them. When Joshua led Israel into the promised land, the people of Canaan identified them with the Lord God. You look in chapter 2 and verse 9 of Joshua, where there, the two spies, the two scouts are speaking with Rahab, and Rahab lets them in on a little something. And that is that as soon as we heard these things, the people of, of Jericho had heard about all God had done for, for Israel. And, and she said, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. She said, the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So even the pagan Canaanites recognized that Israel was identified with the Lord God creator of the universe. The bread and juice of communion. These things symbolize our oneness in Christ. You know, each piece broken off of that same loaf or that same hard, flat piece of matzah. And it's separated. But part of what nourished you this morning nourished me this morning. In a sense, because we are each a part of the same body, what I do affects you, and what you do affects me. You see, from our relationship with Jesus, we have a relationship together as true sons and daughters of God. The Bible says in places like Romans 8.15 that those who receive Jesus become as adopted sons and daughters of God, loved just as much as true-born children. Our identity as Christians is as children of God. 
In Mark 3, Jesus looked around at the people that, that surrounded him, and he said, here's my family. Through Christ, we are brothers and sisters. Having been brought near to God by the blood of Christ, we are brothers and sisters. This is wonderful because we are identified as children of God. But it's also wonderful because none of us is alone in any of our trials or in any of our sufferings or in temptation. And none of us have to bear any burden alone unless we choose to. We have God. We have one another. This also means, again, that what affects you affects me. What affects me affects you. Paul started out his letter to the Corinthians confronting disunity. And that disunity that he confronted, or unity in the body of Christ, has been kind of this underlying uh, theme throughout. In the matter of liberties, our Christian liberties, our freedoms in Christ, it was a matter, Paul said, of putting others first rather than weakening one another through self-concern. And so Paul brings up communion in relation to this discussion of pagan feasts, and he does this to make a point that communion with Christ is one thing, and communion with false idols is another. In each case, it is an implied union. It is an implied participation. It is identity. It is identification. One cannot identify with both Christ and idols. Divided loyalties are dangerous. When we take communion, we associate in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We, we gather not around the cross. The price has been paid. We, we gather not around the tomb. He's not there. He's risen. We gather together in our identification with Christ. Consider the, the fellowship offering. If you were here when we were going through Leviticus, and it's, wow, it's probably been a couple of years now since we have been in Leviticus, but you can get that online if you want to go back. Go to Leviticus 7. There we talked about this fellowship offering, also been called a peace offering. In the fellowship offering, the sacrifice was voluntary, and it was the only offering in which the one, the offerer, received back a portion. And what they would do is they would use that portion to throw a feast for their family and friends. So in a sense, the sacrifice brought them all together. And this is not unlike the, the agape feast that we're going to share today. But it's also not unlike communion in which we receive back from the sacrifice. The fellowship offering celebrated joyful gratitude for that fellowship. It was shared. And because it was shared, it was also a witness to others. In the fellowship offering, we find a picture of our own fellowship with the Father. It's a picture of the sacrifice that brought us peace and fellowship with Him, but also which joins us together as one in Christ. When the Israelites ate together of the fellowship or the peace sacrifice, the fellowship offering, they associated in it. Both communion and the fellowship offering feast represent our identity with and union with God. Let's continue here. Verse 18 says, Observe Israel after the flesh. So he's not speaking about spiritual Israel. He's speaking about Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? When Israel, we look back at Numbers 25 earlier, when Israel succumbed to idolatry there, they succumbed to demonic influence. So 
Although in reality, an idol is nothing, there's a demonic power behind it. Our participation in that idolatry causes us to participate with that demonic power. For one who is joined to Christ to go to an idol temple and participate in a religious ceremony would be like having an affair with a demon. It's counterintuitive, and it's just plain wrong. Now, clearly, something like this would anger the Lord. In studying his written word, we find in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, that our God self-describes himself as a jealous God. The Hebrew word is kana, and it means that he is intolerant of rivalry. It's, it's much like a, like a loving husband over his wife. Only it's jealousy without any sin on God's part. He does not want us to belong to or be joined together with that which is not of him. So is idolatry possible today? You, you bet it is. Our idols, they, they may not be wood and stone, but they're just as real, even more real because they go beyond the physical and, and they have spiritual influence. Idolatry is relying on anything other than God. The people of Corinth relied on idols to bring them fortune, good health, large families, good crops, a, a paycheck and the like. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things, fortune, good health, large families, good crops, or, or a paycheck. There's nothing wrong with those things. It's how we get them and who we acknowledge as the source. That's what gets us into trouble. Now, I think there is also some sound counsel here that we need to pay attention to. To identify with Christ and then be participating in something that is not according to the character of God there's, there's just no way to get around it. It's a bad testimony. And you know what? That may even mean having to consider appearance. In some places, Christian behavior includes or excludes things that are not necessarily scriptural, but are instead cultural. Now, we may not agree with it, but we should make it a consideration. And that, that may mean that we have to sacrifice certain liberties that we have. Now, I know this is hard to believe, but I'm going to walk a fine line here in the risk of offending someone. I, I think it's important for us to examine our activities. Is what we are involved with supported by demonic power? Well, okay, what does that mean? It means, does it point people to Christ or point people away from Christ? And again, that may even go beyond scriptural things to, to staying away from things that are cultural taboos. You know, Satan is slick, man. He's the original con artist. He knows how to arouse us to elevate our liberty over our testimony. Do we really want to support the enemy that hates us. Yet, Christians are extremely prone to willful exertion of liberty in prideful neglect of our Christian testimony. I was walking through Target the other day, and, and guess what was on the shelf with Monopoly and Scrabble and Life? The Ouija board game. It, it, it's not a fun family game. It's a gimmick. It's a trick to pull you toward darkness. Its connection is to the demonic. Now, as a Christian, it would be a serious mistake to use one. But I guarantee that there are Christian families that own one. Um, I, I saw the other day that there's a, a large local Baptist church that's, that's offering yoga classes. Now, I know somebody's going to hear that and say, don't mess with my yoga. <laughs> and I understand there's great exercise in it. But, you know, and you may be doing it purely just for the health and the exercise, but remember that those poses and those things 
come from a system that was designed to bring a person in contact with a spirit world. The, the Sanskrit word yoga, it means union or yoking. And that yoking is the human spirit with the Hindu gods. The, the greeting that you would hear at a yoga class, namaste, it means the God in me bows down to the God in you. Yoga teaches that we are all divine. Anybody who knows Christianity very well knows that's the opposite of what the Bible teaches. It makes no sense for a Christian to be involved in yoga, much less for a church to lead Christians in it. Now, there may be other things. Pray about it. You know, and use your discernment. God has given you discernment. What if someone asked you to be part of a homosexual wedding ceremony? What if it was a good friend or a family member? Are you being a light by participating in it? Or are you lending credibility to the ceremony? You would be, my contention is that you would be a much greater light by declining the invitation and taking the time to explain why. Now, of course, as I've mentioned multiple times now, we took communion together this morning. That's koinonia, fellowship and participation with Christ and with one another. Outside of here, are you participating with things that are not of Christ? I would, I would encourage you to examine your life and see if there is anything that you need to change. Now, in a moment, Paul is going to give us a, a general rule of thumb when it comes to this sort of thing. So let's keep reading. Verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So again, as we saw earlier, I believe it was back in chapter 8, there was this slogan that, that was being used. And Paul here quotes that very slogan back to them. There's something bigger going on here than just whether or not you're permitted to do something. The bigger questions are, how are your actions going to reflect on the Lord? How will they affect your Christian walk? How will they influence those around you for the gospel? In verse 23, there's that word, edify. It's the Greek word, Eco domeo. Eco 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 domeo. Yeah, eco domeo. It means strengthen and build up. Does that which you plan on doing or that which you are participating in, does it strengthen or build you up in Christ? Back in chapter six, Paul made almost the exact statement. In a practical right here, right now statement, Paul says, hey, is what you are doing going to benefit your walk? Will it edify you in the Lord or will it strengthen the enemy? Does it give Satan inroads to your life or does it lead to temptation for me to do things that are most definitely wrong? Consider those things. Could you be stumbled by it? Is it a bridge to something else? But we need to go beyond that. We need to ask, is what I'm doing benefit, benefiting or hurting someone else? Especially someone who is younger in the faith and might be tripped up by my actions. Will it strengthen you and your brother or sister in Christ? Will it edify, will it edify you and your brother and sister in Christ? Will it encourage you and your brother and sister in Christ? Or will it cause confusion for everyone involved? Do you have to hide it to do it? That's a big one. Do you have to hide it to do it? We need to ask ourselves that question. And this is where Paul's going. Verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So taking the family out at the temple of Aphrodite was definitely out of the picture. That means Hooters is out of the picture. That means the, the 
Tilted kilt is out of the picture. But the Corinthians also wondered, what about at the local markets? See, sometimes meat that had been used in the sacrifices to the idols made its way to being sold in the markets. And, of course, it wasn't marked as that. The meat wasn't labeled as having come from sacrifices to false gods, to to idols. So Paul uses a kind of don't ask policy. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 11, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of his mouth. The meat itself is not changed by having been sacrificed to an idol. But Paul continues in verse 27, if any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. Conscience, I say not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? If you're invited to eat with someone, Paul says, and you want to go, just don't ask where the food came from. But if you're told that it came from idols, then don't partake. That's not because it can harm you physically in some way, but because it can harm your testimony. That's not a prideful thing. It's out of consideration to the other who desperately needs to know Jesus. If if it's another Christian that pointed it out, then abstain from it for the sake of his conscience. Even though you may be able to partake of it with thanksgiving. In that case, not receiving from the meal is a testimony of Christ. It may open the door to further ministry. Plus, you don't have to risk stumbling another brother or sister in the Lord. Now, back in chapter 9, Paul talked about becoming like others to win them to Christ. So if someone is obviously troubled by something I do, then I won't do it within reason. If someone is troubled by the good that I do, like sharing the gospel or confronting evil, then it's not going to stop me. That includes not participating in something that could harm my testimony or disparage the Lord. But I shouldn't be paranoid either. If I don't know and I'm able to participate with a clear conscience, giving thanks to the Lord, I'm fine. Let's say someone gives you a gift. You receive it gratefully. We all like getting gifts. My birthday is August 28th. (laughs) So you receive a gift. Then they tell you that they got this as a result of witchcraft. It's some kind of talisman or something like that. Though the thing itself is morally neutral... The idea that it is partnered with witchcraft carries some hefty spiritual consequences. So you would decline it, saying that you're not going to have anything to do with the worship of Satan. Paul is pretty specific, saying that it's not for himself that it matters, but for the sake of the other who may be watching and listening to how you react. So Paul sums it up this way with verse 31. Through 33, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So here it is, I mean, plain and simple. Whatever you do, Decide whether God will be lifted up or given a bad name. Will someone be more or less likely to fall in love with Christ through your actions? It might be something you say, well, gosh, I just, I love this thing. This this thing is important to me, but the perception of it might stumble a weaker believer. It takes maturity 
It takes knowledge of the Lord, and it takes experience walking, walking and stumbling with him. We should realize the freedoms we have, but also the repercussions of exercising those freedoms without regard for others. If you feel something is in a gray area and just isn't proper, you shouldn't force that opinion on someone else. Paul said he is not to be judged by the conscience of another. Christians often fight over really silly things and, and yet don't focus on what is most important. The most important is sharing the love of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anything that detracts from that, detracts from that which Christ himself commissioned us to do. So how important is the salvation of others to you? To Paul, it was so important that he was willing to give up freedoms he had in Christ in order not to stumble someone else. And it was so important to Paul that he would be watchful of how others perceived him in matters that were important to salvation. Paul made it clear that he is indeed free to do whatever he wants, and so are we. The two things to keep in mind are, does it bring glory to God? And does it make someone else less or more likely to accept the gospel? Rather than follow a set of do's and don'ts, we learn to love Christ and become like him. Then we know how to act in every situation that we find ourselves. In conclusion, I want to take a few minutes to review some of the important things we can glean from this chapter. And we're going to, we're going to reach all the way back to the beginning of the chapter where we studied last week. One lesson we can learn from this is that we who are maturing in Christ are not immune to temptation. I saw that in verses 1 through 13. Do you learn from others' mistakes? God has given us a detailed account of the mistakes made by other people in his word, and we can learn from it. We won't learn, though, if we just disregard Scripture, if we say, well, that's Old Testament. I'm not going to study that. I'm just going to focus on New Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all Scripture is profitable. Scripture also helps us to learn from our own mistakes. Paul said in Romans 7, Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But Scripture does something else. It, it, it itself provides a means of escape. Are you tempted? Then pick up your Bible and start reading. Consider that, that many households have multiple Bibles. I wonder how many temptations are yielded to within easy reach of Scripture. Secondly, we should not participate in the world's idolatry. I saw that in verses 14 through 22. Idolatry is setting up something that comes between you and God. It's something that precedes your walk with the Lord. Are you aware of it in your own life? Are you knowingly participating in activities that are in rebellion against God? Item three, we should consider the spiritual consequences of our behavior. We saw that in verses 23 through 31. If you are sowing to the flesh, to the enemy, the results are death. Maybe not eternal hellfire if you're a believer, but certainly loss of fellowship, loss of growth, loss of blessing. But we like to think of ourselves as being exempt but if instead we realize how fragile we are and how fragile others are, we would be more circumspect about our cavalier attitude towards these things. I want to repeat something I, I said earlier. It may have been last week. I was trying to think. The trouble with the Israelites 
was that they trusted their own judgment more than God's judgment. And they kept looking back. They, they kept longing for the old life, which was familiar to them. They knew what the old life was like. But they longed for that more than the promise of the new life, that which was unknown. We have God's written word here, and there is no situation we will ever encounter that we cannot find or discover how we should respond or how we should live or what we should do. It doesn't speak to every single situation we may find ourselves in, but, at least specifically, but we can find in it counsel that we should regard others ahead of ourselves. And so instead of asking, well, how is this going to affect me if I participate in this, if I do this, if I yield to this, we ask, how is this going to affect someone else? Is somebody going to see me doing this? And it may be my liberty to be able to do this, but it's going to offend their conscience. And it's not edifying and it's not encouraging toward them. Does it point to Jesus? Does it point to self? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, that we had time in your written word. Lord, as we study, I, I pray that you planted seeds from these things. We surely can't remember everything that was said in this past hour. So, Father, we rely on, on you placing these things in our hearts. And when we encounter situations where we really could use the word that we heard, Lord, I pray that you would bring it back to our remembrance. I pray that we would be Christians who put others first, who consider others before we consider self. And that's not easy. So we ask that you would empower us to do that. Lord, we thank you for the food that we're going to enjoy in this agape feast here in a few minutes. We thank you that you have provided it and it has your blessing on it. We thank you for those who brought it, who prepared it, because they desired to bless us through it, Lord. So we ask your blessing on them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen.